I, first of all, I strongly believe that every kid, uh, every child should learn coding. We should actually teach them coding in school in the same way that we teach them physics and geography and, uh, you know, literacy and math and whatnot. Those are all fundamental skills. Coding is one such skill because software is everywhere. And in fact, our day-to-day -day is dominated by software already. You can't really live your life, uh, travel, um, uh, wake up in the morning without software anymore. And I think as, as humans, it is crucial to not only be in read-only mode, but also be uh, able to create uh, things ourselves or at least understand how, how creation is done on these devices. My name is Thomas and I'm a developer. I've been developing uh, software since the early 1990s and today uh, my role is mostly being the GitHub CEO, leading uh, the largest developer platform uh, on this planet. I was born in uh, 1978 in East Berlin when Germany was uh, divided into two countries. So I was on the on the eastern side uh, in Berlin in, in a suburb called uh, Marzahn. I grew, you know, had a normal childhood, um, but I was fascinated by technology, uh, remote control cars, uh, uh, you know, little computer games. Uh, in 1989, the wall fell, and, and that opened up, you know, a whole new world to me as an 11-year-old. Um, obviously, from a, from a toy perspective, um, getting access to to Lego and, and Mickey Mouse, but also uh, to um, uh, to computers and so in the early 90s um, I bought my first computer Commodore uh, 64 and after um, uh, university um, I went to technical university in Berlin I actually uh, went into the automotive industry uh, I started working at uh, Mercedes, uh, back then it was called uh, Daimler Chrysler, working on driver assistance system uh, for, for the S-Class. And I did that uh, uh, for a while and then switched to the supplier side uh, to Bosch, uh, uh, which is you know, a large automotive supplier amongst, amongst other things. And, and there uh, I worked you know, on parking systems. And it was in 2008 uh, that two things happened. One is I finished my uh, PhD thesis, uh, but also Steve Jobs uh, showed the iPhone SDK. Everybody wanted to build apps. Um, and, and at the time, only Apple could build native apps. Apps. And I thought this is this is cool. I gotta you know build apps myself, and I gotta get into that space. And so I quit my job at Bosch uh, at the height of the financial crisis, uh, amongst all things, uh, in late 2008, and um, reconnected with a friend uh, from from university. And um, we just became you know two freelance developers and um, building apps uh, for the German market, so mostly agency work or, or subcontractor for, for larger app projects. I think in, in 2009 and 10 we built around uh, 30 apps. That work on building apps um, for, for, for mostly German customers, um, German enterprise customers, media and, and automotive and so on, got us the idea of, of building a platform for mobile app developers. And so we, um, uh, together with uh, three friends, Stefan, Andreas and, and Michael, uh, we founded a company called Hockey app, which was a platform for mobile app developers. You could uh, distribute your beta builds and um, collect uh, um, error reports, crash reports, and feedback and, and those kind of things. And so we built that startup, you know, the platform for our own, you know, freelance business because we had that pain point that we wanted to solve uh, for ourselves. Um, because it was before that you would send, you know, a build uh, over email, you know, to to a project manager um, in Berlin or so, and then the project manager would take that build and send it to the customer and explain to them, oh, you have to, you know, uh, drag and drop that into iTunes and connect, you know, uh, the dock cable and, and, and all these kind of things. And so we made that very easier, which made our own life easier. And I think those are some of the greatest startup ideas when you're using it yourself uh, uh, day in, day out and then improving it um, based on the feedback that you're getting from your own customers. So we basically started building out the, the hockey app business um, while we had the, the contracting business. And they were companies um, both about the same size. And um, when Microsoft came in, in uh, 2014, we thought they would only buy uh, the hockey app platform and the product business and, and leave the contracting business alone uh, g given there were existing customer uh, contracts and, uh, and what have you. Uh, but in fact, Microsoft bought both companies, uh, the, the subsidiary, the product company, and the, the mothership, the, the contracting company, because the contracting company had a, a number of iOS and Android developers uh, that were a hot commodity uh, in 2014 and, and hard to hire, um, uh, certainly, you know, at, at startup rates. And so Microsoft actually took over both of those companies. And uh, a fun, funny story is today uh, of these 11 employees, uh, seven, uh, including myself, uh, work for GitHub. And so with different paths, um, uh, they all uh, got to Microsoft and then from Microsoft into GitHub. You know, coming from a small company of, of our size based in Germany, in Stuttgart, Germany, Southwest Germany, uh, moving, you know, halfway around the world. I moved with my wife and back then uh, two very young kids. Uh, to Seattle, that alone was a big change. And looking back now, um, uh, 10 years later, and we moved, we moved in, in early 2015, it feels all like a blur, uh, like things moved so fast and 
uh, sometimes I don't even realize how we did all that. Our startup was very small and, and bootstrapped um, for the whole time, so we never took any outside investment uh, un until Microsoft uh, acquired us. And at that point in time, uh, I think it was about 11 or, or 12 employees, so still very small team, uh, all, of, all of engineers, uh, you know, building, building the product together. And uh, in, in some ways, you know, my role today as GitHub CEO uh, um, is very similar uh, in that, you know, um, my developer skills, uh, my understanding of code, my, um, you know, empathy for, for how software developers work uh, helped me both with my, you know, uh, internal team of about a thousand uh, engineers and with our customer base, which are also all uh, software developers or those that aspire to become software developer. And so I think, you know, a lot of the, you know, my passion for software development is actually perfect, you know, for me uh, uh, being, being the GitHub CEO. I don't think I've seen anything more exciting and, and, and changing how uh, we think about software development in my in my 30 uh, plus year career as a software developer. You know, when I started coding in the early 1990s, uh, there wasn't even the internet or I, I certainly had no internet access. And so I had to figure it out all, out, uh, all by myself uh, with, with books and with magazines, um, going to a computer club in the community center, kind of hoping that somebody will be there. Um, if we fast forward to where we are now, is that it's so much easier to get into into software development. You can, you know, just write a prompt into Copilot or or ChatGPT or, or similar tools, and it uh, will likely write you, um, um, you know, a basic web page um, or a small uh, application, a, a game. Uh, in Python and so AI makes software development uh, so much more accessible um, for anyone who wants to learn coding. And on the other side of the spectrum, it makes developers so much more productive. Most uh, developers that uh, work on a project have way uh, too much work to do. Uh, they have long backlogs um, of their own ideas of customer feedback, you know, uh, things that they're hearing from their managers or uh, from the market uh, or they're seeing at competitors. And so uh, almost any software project that has a certain you know, age um, has way too much work on the innovation side, but they also have what we call technical debt, uh, you know, legacy code, things that have, you know, been created uh, over, over months or years that need a cleanup, uh, that need what we call refactoring. And so engineers constantly balance those two backlogs. So having something that brings the effort down and makes them, you know, 10%, 20%, maybe even 50% more productive is, is completely changing uh, how software developers work. The role of GitHub, you know, in this, in the first, uh, let's say, you know, five years of the age of AI, um, given that we started working on GitHub Copilot in uh, June 2020, right after uh, GPT-3 uh, uh, was was first shown to the world, is that we want to be, you know, on the forefront um, of uh, AI code generation. We want to provide um, a tools to developer to be more productive and more happy uh, than, than writing code. Because the reality is the dream, I think for most developers that start their, their journey um, uh, uh, as a programmer is that they have an idea in their head and they're trying to find a way how they get, can get the fastest from that idea to an app or, or web page or service, right? Like the challenge is not that developers uh, uh, don't have enough ideas. The challenge is that you take that big idea and you have to break it down into small building blocks and as you're working on the first block or the first module or the first class or, uh, or microservice, whatever it is, you're, you're realizing that this, this idea that you have is so much more complex to implement than, than you thought. And so from what became a weekend project, uh, it becomes a month long or sometimes year long project. And many, you know, apps that uh, I wrote uh, as a teenager, and I know, you know, many of my friends and, and my employees wrote, never get anywhere because you, you ultimately realize it's much more complex than you thought and it's not worth uh, spending the time on it. And in, in the world that we live today, you can always, you know, download an app from the app store or find, you know, some online service that does the same thing. So I think AI helps us, you know, to realize the dream of taking an idea and implementing it much faster. And you see um, some of the early signs of that where very small startups, sometimes, you know, five developers, um, and some of them actually only one developers, uh, uh, believe they can become million, uh, if not billion dollar businesses by leveraging all the AI agents uh, uh, that are available to them and maybe building their own uh, to, to write code, uh, to write software much faster. Now, the flip side of that is that, you know, uh, I don't think we're anywhere close to a world where you can just write a single prompt and say build GitHub and then an AI agent builds all of the features of GitHub um, or even just the very basic primitives like repository storage, you know, Git storage and uh, issue tracking. Um, because the, the decisions um, that we as developers, as engineers, as product managers have to make to build a complex system like GitHub, you know, 
thousands, if not tens of thousands, decisions. Um, there's the simple ones, right? Like which programming language, which, which open source framework, which cloud to use, or do we even use a cloud, which operating system, and, and so on. But there's the much more complex uh, decisions of how you architect the system. You know, how, are you building a monolith and are, are you by building microservices? And getting to a point where agents can make all these decisions and write an app that actually is a viable business, you know, finds product market fit, has a great user experience, and, and ultimately generates both revenue and profit. Uh, because any business at some point has to get to the place where they're making profit and, and return that profit to the, to the founders or shareholders. That I think we're, we're quite far away. And so we need uh, engineers uh, to do engineering stuff. They, they need to exercise their craft and uh, uh, apply systems thinking and uh, design and, and, and build really great applications. I think the unique thing about GitHub is its size and both the love uh, that developers have for you know, our brand um, for our mascot, um, the Octocat, or we call it internally Mona, um, and um, the reputation uh, that GitHub has created for itself um, since ver the very early days, since the, I remember the early launch of GitHub and, and meeting um, or seeing um, Chris, one of the founders, speaking at uh, RailsConf in, in Las Vegas in, in 2009, and then signing up for my own account and, and started using it. I, I was excited about using GitHub and now we are uh, in, in 2025 and there's still many people that uh, love GitHub but you know what, what comes with love is also that you're not holding back your criticism and that we have 150 million users and uh, uh, on the platform and so you, there's at least you know a million opinions of what are the things we should invest on and what's working well and, and what's not working well and what's the one feature that is important you know to th that set of users while it's not important uh, to, to me and, and, and my product leadership team because we have you know our own uh, strategy and decisions to make so filtering out the signal from the noise, and I don't mean noise in any negative way, it's just so much feedback that we're getting. I remember uh, when, we, when we did the acquisition in 2018 and I joined GitHub and afterwards um, we sent an email to 10 GitHub users and say, hey, we are looking into a new project, we would love your feedback. I think we got nine responses of exciting users saying, we want to we provide feedback. If you do that uh, in many other companies and startups, you get one response. And the one response is kind of like, well, I have like 10 minutes time to, gi to give you some feedback. There's just so much um, uh, uh, information that's, that's coming back to us um, on, on social media and our platform and in email and support tickets and so on. The second piece, you know, that comes to mind is that GitHub um, for the longest time has been a company with a very strong remote culture. Like long before COVID, uh, the GitHub founders uh, started hiring um, developers, uh, sales folks, support folks all over the world. And today, I think we're one of the largest remote only companies. We all work, you know, from our homes or from, you know, the hotel in, in Seoul um, or from, from wherever we are. And so a lot of um, our culture is focused around GitHub as a platform, which obviously through open source uh, encourages um, uh, asynchronous uh, uh, collaboration. Uh, and, and tools like Slack um, uh, and, and video, ch video calls um, uh, that we use much more heavily uh, internally than we're using email like, like old school uh, companies do. And so when I wake up in the morning, uh, especially here you know, in Seoul, uh, which is like lots of time zones away uh, from, from the US uh, where, where about 80% of our employee population is, is that I wake up to 30, 40 Slack messages, uh, plus you know, uh, uh, hundreds of channels uh, with, with conversation and then figuring out you know, what is actually important for me as CEO, what, what to react to, what can I snooze uh, for a while and what can I just ignore. That, that's the, you know, a big part of my job. But it's also so exciting because uh, you know, I can be here uh, in South Korea um, at, at this event and, and still, still run the company. And a lot of you know, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis doesn't actually matter whether I'm here in Seoul or whether I'm in Berlin or whether in, I'm in New York or anywhere else in the world. And, and I think that's for, for many hubbers, how we call our employees, a really strong part of our culture that we are a remote company. Uh, it's not related to the pandemic, it's a choice that we made of how we want to run the company, you know, how we select uh, GitHub as an employer, and ultimately how we believe we can be successful. I, first of all, I strongly believe that every kid, uh, every child should learn coding. And we should actually teach them coding in school in the same way that we teach them physics and geography and uh, you know, literacy and math and whatnot. Those are all fundamental skills. Coding is one such skill. And it just has taken us too long to actually realize that. Because software is everywhere. Um, hardware is also everywhere. We carry, we carry both software and hardware with us uh, through our day. And in fact, our day-to-day -day is dominated by software already. You can't really 
uh, live your life, uh, travel, um, uh, wake up in the morning without software anymore. And I think as, as humans, it is crucial to not only uh, be in read-only mode, but also be uh, able to create uh, things ourselves, or at least understand how, how creation is done on these devices. That doesn't mean that every you know, 18, 19 year old when they leave high school become a software developer in the same way that not every uh, a kid that learns physics or, or chemistry in school becomes a physicist, right? Just because you learn those fundamental skills doesn't mean that you decide for yourself that that's the career path to take. So that's number one, you, you, gotta, you gotta learn coding. I think number, number two is you gotta use AI to do that. And, and you know, whether it's here in Korea or in Germany, uh, most kids, um, uh, and in fact, you know, most, most people don't speak fluent English, um, which is the primary language of software development. And so it democratizes access to technology. And that's true for many other uh, things in the world. And so having uh, an agent available uh, that answers you any question, but also lets you, you know, realize your dream and uh, building your dream uh, is incredibly exciting. And then the third thing, you know, for anyone who is already a software developer or wants to, you know, develop their craft is you gotta keep, you gotta keep rehearsing. You gotta keep, keep training. You gotta keep learning. There's, you're never done with learning. If I look back 30 years of what development looked like back then and what it looks like now, um, I would have been, you know, um, very behind if I hadn't constantly read blog posts, um, uh, literature um, and, and tried out things myself. So I think those are uh, as, as crucial as they were in the 90s, they're still crucial in 2025. We just have so much more access to information uh, to become you know, top of the field. The obvious answer is that I most enjoy using GitHub Copilot, right? Like that's our product, uh, it's our baby. Uh, we're working on this day in, day out. I often, you know, uh, see features long before the world sees that. And, and the flip side is also true that I often don't actually know what's shipped versus what is, you know, in, in preview or uh, in, in internal ships. And so I'm daily excited about what we're building there. And I'm using a lot of that myself as I am at heart a developer. And sometimes it's very simple, you know, asking it to, to write me a quick script that, that downloads, you know, IDs of all our repositories um, uh, from our API. And in the past, I would have gone, you know, to our API documentation and figured that out all myself and probably would have taken me like half an hour to, to get to, you know, a, a, a shell script that does that. Today, I just ask Copilot and it writes me the script and it works within within minutes. Um, and I think actually that's the uh, one of the true superpowers of AI, whether that's learning to code or exploring the world. You have um, uh, an assistant available to you that has infinite patience, you know, it doesn't judge you. Um, it will, you know, uh, ChatGPT or Copilot never tells you what, what a stupid question Tom is. It always gives you an answer. And it even accepts when you tell it it's wrong or it needs to, you know, explore the topic a little bit further. You know, you have seen uh, the prompt examples where by telling it to outline its thought process, it actually gets to to a better answer. I love using it for my blog posts and a PowerPoint presentation to just uh, generate uh, some images and, and play with that. Um, I'm, I'm really bad at using Photoshop and, and, and drawing myself, but I'm, I'm really creative and I can write prompts and, and figure out how to rewrite the prompt to make the image look more than uh, more more closely to what I had in my head. There's you know tools that we are using like Teams Copilot to summarize meetings, especially when I am on business trips like that, um, uh, where I miss a lot of the meetings that happen uh, in on the West Coast and West Coast time zone. Just getting a summary, figuring out other action items for me. Uh, same for summarizing emails. Um, uh, you know, using something like Reclaim AI to, to manage my calendar. Those things are making me more productive. And I think the really exciting thing is that there's always a new tool to try out and see is that how far along that journey is AI and how much more do we still have to do as an industry to actually get to that to that dream of, of having an orchestra of agent uh, that, that we're controlling during our personal and our professional lives.